Okay, so officially welcome to SkinPix August webinar. As you can see from the title, today we will be talking about uh, mindfulness and uh, skin picking. Okay, so this is me pre-COVID hair without glasses. Uh, so for those of you who are here for the first time, um, and don't know me, my name is Vladimir. I'm a medical doctor, a psychotherapist, and a mindfulness teacher. I work for SkinPick, and I'm the person you get to hang out with every month when we have our little webinars. Um, for those of you who are not in the program, but you're thinking about joining, just a side note, I put it here so I don't forget. Uh, SkinPick is offering a, a coupon that you can see on the screen. Uh, that will give you a $60 discount for the first month, but it's only valid for one week. So it's a discount that's a bit larger than usual, but it's valid for one week. So until basically next Tuesday. I will put it also in the end so that you can, uh, so that I suppose that you can write it down if you need it. Um, as usual, if uh, while I'm going on and on, uh, you're free to ask questions. Just please uh, use the Q&A option for the questions. And then once I finish with the, with the webinar part, I will get to all of your questions. Uh, so as long as it takes, I will answer all of your questions. So this is something that these are some of the topics that we will be addressing tonight. So we'll be talking about what exactly mindfulness is. What are some misconceptions about mindfulness that are quite popular? Uh, we will be establishing a foundation for your own mindfulness practice. Uh, I will tell you sort of how to make sense of the experience of mindfulness and also some practical tips about how to go about starting a mindfulness practice. And I will offer resources that you can use to start your own practice. I will talk a little bit about neuroscience uh, and what we understand so far about how mindfulness works and why it works. Uh, this is of course not really necessary for actual practice, but I do find it very useful and informative. And I think it also helps make the case about why mindfulness can be so useful with skin making, which is after all why we're all here. Um, this has partially been um, requested by you in previous webinars because I mentioned mindfulness here and there when we talked about different topics and people told me that it would be nice to have a uh, webinar that sort of gives a, a more systematic introduction into mindfulness. And also for those of you who are in the program yourselves at this time, as you know, mindfulness is one, one important part of the program. So this is a way to get some additional information because the way that mindfulness is approached in the program is not exactly identical to the way I will approach it here. I thought it would be nice to come at it from two different angles so that you get a fuller picture. So let's just jump right in and start with defining mindfulness. I'm going to do three things here. First, give you a definition and then explain it. Uh, then I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the history of mindfulness, at least as it pertains to psychology. Just enough so that you can understand where mindfulness is coming from. And then I'm going to tell you about my approach to mindfulness. Not that I think it's particularly unique, uh, just maybe as a kind of pointer to where you can go with your own practice should you decide to start one. Uh, so let's start with the definition so that we know what we're talking about. Um, so this definition is by John Kabat-Zinn, and I really like the way he talks about mindfulness, the way he writes about mindfulness. He's very simple, very to the point, and this is why I chose his definition. There are others out there, and if you've been reading about mindfulness, you may, not, you may notice that not everyone entirely agrees on how to define the term. And once you start practicing mindfulness, you will see why it's extraordinarily difficult to describe what exactly happens when, you, when you're meditating. So John Kabat-Zinn says, mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way. So on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. So as you can see, it's a way of practicing and using and manipulating our attention. 
but not just in any random way. On purpose means that we select, <coughs> sorry, that we select what we pay attention to. In the present moment is a very important part of the, of the definition, one that I feel kind of people skip over. It means what's happening now and now and now. So mindfulness is not necessarily about thinking, why is this happening to me? Or how can this be happening to me? It's just about what. So it's not why, how, it's just what. What exactly is happening moment to moment? Because one thing about our experience that you understand the second you start meditating is that it's constantly changing. So mindfulness is just a way of observing how your experience changes from moment to moment. And then finally, non-judgmentally. So this is the only part of the definition that I don't like. Uh, in one sense, I don't think we can actually think without making judgments. So if I feel back pain while I meditate, well, as soon as I call it back pain, it is a kind of judgment, right? If I, if I have a thought about not wanting to wake up early tomorrow, for example, that is a kind of judgment. So when, when he says non-judgmentally here, what he actually means is with acceptance or in an accepting way. I will talk about acceptance a little later because I think it's a very important concept for both psychological change in general and for mindfulness specifically. But here, I think it, it's sufficient to just say that when I say in an accepting way, that doesn't mean that you're supposed to just not think that feeling pain is bad, for example. It just means that you're not going to call yourself names. This is in the simplest terms that I can put this. If let's say you sit and you meditate and you feel the urge to pick your skin, for example, or you succumb to the urge to pick your skin, or you have a very mean thought about someone, you're not going to call yourself a horrible person or a failure. That would be judgmental. So you can say, I'm having this thought, just label the thought, but not call yourself a certain kind of a person because you're having some thoughts. So that's non-judgmentally. Mindfulness is supposed to open us up to embrace our present moment experience. So let me just sort of briefly emphasize again what's important about this definition. So it's awareness of what's happening, and it's an intentional cultivation of awareness. So it's not just random, it's structured and it's systematic, and it's a compassionate accepting awareness. So it's essentially, it's opening up to whatever is happening right now. So what is it not? It's not a religion. Nowadays, people don't talk about, don't have this opinion about mindfulness as they did years ago, but still people somehow and sometimes think that mindfulness has something to do with religion. Naturally, I guess some of you know that mindfulness did come to Western psychology from Buddhism, but it's not, it's, it's a mind training program. It's not, an, it's not a core aspect of Buddhist religion. So you don't have to be Buddhist to meditate. At the same time, mindfulness and meditation are present in nearly every religion and generally every form of spirituality that I know of. So for example, Islam also contains certain ways of meditating. Christians also have certain ways of meditating. Um, Loyola's spiritual exercises, for example, is essentially a 30-day meditation program. Uh, what's different from uh, the meditation as we practice it in, in psychology is that the object of meditation is different. So you can have elements of mindfulness. Centering prayer just comes to my mind is another element of mindfulness. But mindfulness in and of itself is just a capacity of the human brain. It's not a religion, it's not a philosophy. You don't have to believe in anything special or specific to be able to meditate. Second of all, it's not a method to control thoughts. Uh, so my bad grammar aside there on the slide, um, you're not going to stop thinking if you meditate. That, I have to say that right away. So you're not going to learn how to silence your brain. That just does not happen. What happens is that you learn how to develop a different relationship to your thoughts. So no amount of meditating is going to give you the ability to say, 
I will no longer think certain thoughts. Because your brain just makes thoughts. Our brain is like a giant thought-making machine, and it does it all the time. And the more you meditate, the more you realize that some of these thoughts are really outrageous and just ridiculous. And you learn how to develop a more skeptical relationship to your thoughts. But you're not going to learn to silence your brain. I remember one of my teachers used to say, the fact that you're having thoughts just means that you're alive and nothing else. It's also not a method of controlling your emotions, although you will gain more control of your emotions because mindfulness develops equanimity and equanimity allows us to be still as we experience intense emotions. So you're not going to pick and choose what you feel, but you will, be, you will treat your emotions differently as they arise. It's not a relaxa relaxation technique. This is very important because people often think they're doing it right if they feel relaxed afterwards. As you can see from the definition, it's just a way to be with your experience. Very frequently, this, the experience of meditation will be relaxing afterwards, especially body scans and body focus practices. But being relaxed is not the goal of mindfulness. It's also not a life hack. It's not going to solve any problems instantly. And I'm very happy that mindfulness is becoming, becoming more and more popular. But one thing that I don't like is that it's being advertised as a solution for everything. There's like a mindful approach to whatever you like. And mindfulness really is useful for many things. It's just not a quick solution for everything. So mindfulness is a practice. It means that you have to build it over time and its effects don't come overnight. This, I cannot emphasize this point enough. And then finally, mindfulness is not easy to practice. It sounds so lovely and profound and I don't know, you know, when I say it's just about being open to your experience, but it's really difficult to be open to our experience because our experience is sometimes, and I would say more often than not, not entirely pleasant. And sometimes it's excruciating. So mindfulness is like, is like bodybuilding for your brain. It's not very easy. And the last thing to keep in mind is that mindfulness is about practicing. It's not about reading. It's not about thinking about practicing. It's not about um, reading blogs or listening to podcasts, which is all very lovely and nice. But mindfulness is first and foremost something you experience. You don't need too much to get started. You need one book, not even that. At the end of this webinar, and maybe in a day or two when they send you the link to this recording, they will also send you two guided meditations. And with this, you have everything you need to start a practice of your own. You don't need to read 25 books or pay for 70 applications. So you just need to start. So practice of before and above everything. The reason why I say this is because Often I feel that people talk about being more mindful, uh, and, but they say that like it should just come spontaneously, or they say that like I should take things more easy, but they rarely think I will sit and do my practice daily, which is what everything boils down to. So I will have, now give you just a little bit of history about how mindfulness came to psychology and how it became so popular, and then I will use this as a jumping off point to explain what are some benefits and some weaknesses of mindfulness as it is now in psychology. So obviously, like I already said, it comes from Buddhism. Uh, and the reason why it came to psychology from Buddhism and not from, I don't know, let's say Christianity or Islam or any other major religion is because unlike everyone else, Buddhists really elevated the study of the mind to a completely different level. So there are elements of, of mindfulness, like I said, in different spiritual traditions, but Buddhists took it seriously and in a way that no one else did. They were very analytical, very systematic, very scientific in their study. And this is why I think it, it, appeals, to, it appeals to me, and I believe this is why it appealed to other people. On a more down-to-earth level, it's also because the creator of MBSR, which is the first mindfulness-based program that was shown to be effective, John Kabat-Zinn was a trained meditator. So he kind of used what he already had 
in terms of his knowledge and experience. Um, other people on this picture are also quite, so the first person is John Kabat-Zinn. Uh, the first book I ever read was his book and I always recommend them because all of his books are really very nicely written. And also he's very clear and very concise. The second person is Joseph Goldstein. The third is Sharon Salzberg. Both of them excellent teachers. If you're more interested in the kind of rigorous study of mindfulness, Joseph Goldstein is the person to go. And if you're interested in loving kindness, compassion, joy, equanimity, Sharon Salzberg is the person to go. Second row, first person is Robert Thurman. He's Uma Thurman's father, but other than that, he's a remarkable teacher. Now, all these teachings are explicitly Buddhist. So everyone else here tries to adjust sort of Buddhism to our Western ways of talking and thinking and kind of pick and choose what they will take because Buddhism is very pragmatic and even Buddhists don't think of mindfulness as being anything um, that you cannot do if you're not a Buddhist. So they will kind of offer it to you, whatever your religion or philosophical beliefs are. But Robert Thurman is a Buddhist himself. And so everything he writes is from a Buddhist perspective. I just sort of felt the need to emphasize that, but his books are really, really remarkable. He's just an incredibly intelligent person. Uh, next to him is Tara Brack. Uh, I've recommended her books in the past. I sometimes have issues with her style. It's kind of slightly new agey for my taste, uh, but she's a very experienced therapist and there's a lot to learn from her. Her two books, Radical Acceptance and Radical Compassion are really very good introductions to my books. Next to her is uh, Jack Cornfield and then Underneath all of them is, well, the Buddha. I mean, that's, that's a household name. Uh, so even though, like I said, the origins are in Buddhism, mindfulness in itself is a secular practice. And it's pretty much integrated into any kind of psychotherapy that you will take today. So if you go to a therapist, they're likely to include mindfulness in one way or another. Uh, in dialectical behavioral therapy, mindfulness is is a mandatory part. CBT uses a lot of mindfulness. Acceptance and commitment therapy, a type of CBT that Skin Peaks program is based on, also incorporates a lot of mindfulness. Gestalt therapy, constructivist therapy, they all implement mindfulness in one form or another. The reason for this is that mindfulness is a really nice way to learn, to teach people how to think and observe their own experience. So when people are having a hard time realizing what they're feeling or what, they, what they're thinking, mindfulness is a very good way to get people to kind of dive into their own psychological lives. Uh, at the same time, for me at least, uh, the experience of meditation is something akin to being on a psychoanalytic couch, except that you don't have a psychoanalyst standing above your head. But the process is the same. Everything that you would say out loud to a psychoanalyst, you will observe while you do mindfulness. So it's not something unknown to the West. It's just a different approach to many of the themes that we, we've already sort of had present. Uh, one thing that I think mindfulness offers is that you can take this and do it yourself. So you don't need to go to a psychoanalyst five times a week. Uh, you don't need to go to a therapist forever. You can learn how to be your own therapist, I guess. Maybe, maybe that's a part of the appeal of mindfulness to me is that therapy takes a long time very frequently. And as a therapist, I obviously believe in, you know, the therapy is very efficient, but I find that people often cannot pay for therapy for very long. Whereas with mindfulness, people can actually learn to help themselves because they develop a different kind of relationship to their thoughts, to their emotions, to their entire experience. And that, that difference, this kind of the step back that you take with mindfulness gives you just enough control that you can direct your own change however you like. Uh, even though I said like five times now that mindfulness is not religious or philosophical in itself, uh, I personally think that when you take mindfulness out of spiritual traditions, uh, you lose a lot. Uh, in Buddhism, mindfulness is part of something that's called the, the Noble Eightfold Path, which basically outlines your path to enlightenment. 
So it includes right mindfulness, but it also includes right concentration and right speech and right thought and right conduct and, and right livelihood. So it gives you all these ideas and concepts about sort of how to frame the experience that you get when you meditate. So you get, you immediately also get a theory that explains what you experience when you meditate. Uh, especially if you meditate for longer periods of time and over longer periods of time, you're bound to have experiences that are really confusing and sometimes downright scary, I have to say. Uh, so I think it's very helpful to have, um, to have a theoretical framework to understand what intense emotions are, what thoughts are, and why do they arise at certain times. So even though mindfulness is about describing what's happening in the moment, that doesn't mean that you cannot reflect on your experiences afterwards. And especially when experiences are intense and meaningful, it really is very helpful to know what to do with them. So as a therapist, I will usually include mindfulness in a very intentional way. So when we deal with skin picking, I will incorporate mindfulness so that you will, I don't know, become more aware of certain aspects of your skin picking or to develop a different relationship to the urge or whatever the case may be. Once I suggest mindfulness in therapy, you will already know why I'm suggesting it. And when we communicate in therapy, then we get to clarify everything that you experience as you practice mindfulness. But when I teach just mindfulness to people, so I will have every now and then people come and say, well, I just want to learn how to meditate. I'm not interested in therapy. Before COVID, I used to have offline meditation groups. And so when people are not in therapy, they still need some idea to understand what's happening. And then what I like to do is I like to combine Western ideas that are in some way similar to what exists in Buddhism or in religious traditions so that I can offer something as like a platform to get you started so that you can think systematically about your experience. Now, those of you who have attended previous webinars know all these faces here because I just repeat them all the time since I like all of them. So what I usually, where I draw my inspiration from is either constructivist psychology, namely George Kelly, which is uh, this guy here, it's the biggest picture on purpose, or Richard Rorty, who's a pragmatist philosopher, who's this guy here with the big eyebrows. So those are the, all of these people here were very influential. So the, uh, the person that's under Kelly is William James, uh, above Rorty is Dewey, and then above Dewey is a German philosopher with a very complicated name, uh, von Glasserstall is his last name, he's a radical constructivist. So they all influenced my thinking in this way or that way as a therapist, but also as a human being. And then because I find their ideas useful for my life and for my own practice, I like to share some of their ideas to people I teach because I find that it really helps you uh, kind of think through your experiences. Some people will reject their ideas, but then, you know, because they will reject them, they will arrive at some other conclusions. So what are some ideas just roughly? And then we will go on to more practical things. Both Buddhists and pragmatists and constructivists see the world as a kind of ever unfolding process. Uh, so not only is the world an ever unfolding process, you are too and I am too. That means that everything constantly changes. And this is something you can experience very easily with mindfulness. Just sit and listen. And if you listen to the sounds, you will notice, I don't know, cars coming and going, noises arising and passing away, your emotions arising and passing away. So this is very easy to, to kind of just to feel in practice. Second of all is that all our knowledge is hypothetical, uh, meaning that Buddhists, pragmatists, and constructivists all look at knowledge in a kind of, uh, I guess, uh, don't hate me philosophers, but maybe utilitarian way, in a sense that all our knowledge is hypothetical. So um, everything is an assumption, basically. Some assumptions have evidence to support them, so we kind of take them as truths. But in reality, because the world is always changing, our knowledge has to change along. This also means that everything we say about ourselves is only maybe temporarily true, if at all. Because after all, knowledge of the world and knowledge about ourselves is also hypothetical. And then they all also share what we call a relational view of the self. 
I find that this is this sounds very fancy as an idea, but it's very easy to also realize in practice, meaning that the kind of person I am and the kind of person all of you are is because you've interacted with other people and with other things in the world. So because they've shaped your experiences, they've changed you in some way. That's really all it means. There's no essence to me or any of you. We kind of are shaped by our experiences, by what happens to us, and then consequently by how we respond to what happens to us. So we're constantly interacting with the world. That's what relational view of the self. And non-duality, non let's not even go there, or we will spend hours here. But basically, at least the first three things is something that you can very easily experience once you sit down to meditate. You will notice that your emotions will come and go, that external circumstances will come and go. Here's the first and here's the third. You will notice a lot of thoughts. You will notice that you will compare yourself to other people with your thoughts. Here's the third point, relational view of the self. You will notice that some of your thoughts are just obviously inaccurate. Some are just bizarre. Some may or may not be true. And then you will notice that some thoughts cause you to feel all kinds of things. And those are usually the thoughts that we assume are true. So when you meditate, these thoughts, like every thought should be let go of, and I will explain how to do that. But if you journal or use some way of reflection after you meditate, these thoughts that cause the most emotions or those thoughts that were hard to let go of, those are the ones to kind of write down and think about later on. So these are very direct experiences. They are theoretical concepts, but they're very easy to realize just after one mindfulness practice. So how do we go about meditating? Let's, let's start with these practical things. So there are base, four basic postures to meditate. You can do it sitting up, lying down, walking, or standing up. Now, if you're beginners, and I assume that at least some of you are, I do not recommend that you meditate lying down, especially if you're anxious because you will fall asleep just before you even press play to start the guided meditation. My preferred way of meditating uh, and my, the way that I recommend others to meditate is sitting down. If you find yourself to be extremely restless, you can meditate standing up or walking, and that's perfectly okay. I think once your attention stabilizes and once you master the basic techniques, you can also meditate lying down, but in the beginning, I really don't recommend it. You should, of course, do it in a quiet place so that you're not disturbed, I guess as quiet as possible. And before you even start doing anything, you need to set your intention in the beginning. So you need to figure out what type of mindfulness you will practice and for how long. You can set the timer as well. This is very important because once you close your eyes and start doing the exercise, you need to know exactly what to do, or at least roughly what to expect to do. One thing I also like to tell people to avoid, and people very rarely listen to me on this point, is not to do mindfulness before sleep. Very, very frequently when I start teaching mindfulness to people, they will come back and then say, I'll come back. That was back when the world was normal and I could actually be in the same room with people. They will usually say something like, oh, it was really good, I was doing it and I fell asleep and I slept very well. Great, I'm very happy you had a good night's sleep, but that's not meditation. So. To borrow a phrase from John Kabat-Zinn, mindfulness, the goal of meditation is to fall awake, not to fall asleep. You can use mindfulness as a kind of self-hypnosis to fall asleep, and that's perfectly fine. If you're having trouble falling asleep, use it, but that's not meditation. And another thing is that usually after you meditate, you will be a little more rested. So sometimes if you meditate just before you're supposed to go to sleep and you do it properly, you might actually have difficulties falling asleep. So what I like to recommend is during the day, early afternoon, evening, morning, just not before you go to sleep. And of course, avoid meditating after eating because you will fall asleep. These may seem like silly things, but especially the not, uh, not meditating before sleeping is something that I come across very frequently. You don't need any special conditions. Now, you, if you go on any 
website that sells, well, meditation stuff or anything related to that, you will find, you know, 50 different types of meditation cushions or special meditation earplugs or, I don't know, like air mist to, clear, to cleanse the space around. You don't need any of that. You can meditate anywhere, anytime, really. In the beginning, it's good to do it in a quiet place so that you can minimize distractions. But over time, you can practice meditation anywhere. I do it, for example, if I have to stand in line to do some administration or in the store, I will use a moment or two to meditate. But I really like to meditate and I'm kind of a, I'm really crazy about meditation, so I'm, I might be an extreme case there. But my point being is that there are no, there are, people will come with these excuses like I don't have time to meditate or uh, I cannot possibly set aside 15 minutes a day to meditate. And when you think about it, you will waste them a lot more scrolling down your phone. And only one of those two will benefit your mental health. So, or they will say, I don't have money to buy books or I don't have money to sign up for a course. All the resources are available for free that you need. So it's really very easy, no special conditions. How does the process look like? Uh, so what I'm giving you here is a kind of generalized model of what meditation looks like. Uh, different techniques will slightly modify this, but the general principle will remain the same. So you start by having an object of meditation most of the time. That will be frequently your breath, for example. That's my preferred object of meditation because my breath is something I always carry around with me. So it's very easy to tune into my breath. You can use your body, you can use a phrase, you can use a mantra if you like, you can, you can even use external objects such as sound. Or some people like to meditate by focusing on, for example, candlelight. Uh, you have different types of techniques that will have you focus on colors or shapes and stuff like this. But there's usually something to attach to anchor your attention in. So we call that the focus of meditation. What you do is, so you, let's say it's the breath, just to guide you through the, the process. You focus on your breath and you observe the breath. You try to observe it with as many details as you can. So what I usually do is I will focus on my nostrils, but you can, so you can follow the air as it moves through your body. You can focus on any really point in the, in, in, in your breathing cycle, basically. You can focus on, on your throat, you can focus on your lungs, you can focus on your abdomen as well. So any place where you can feel the breath is fine. You focus and you observe very carefully. Uh, you observe the air coming in, the way it expands in the lungs, how it goes out, you observe the temperature of the air, any sort of quality that you can see. There's nothing specific that you should observe, you just look carefully and see what comes out. Because sometimes I will list these things and people will say, well, I couldn't really feel the temperature of the breath. Not the point. Sometimes you won't be able to, sometimes you will be able to. You focus on the breath and then whatever arises is what you observe. At some point, you're bound to become distracted. How frequently depends on how stable your attention is and also what your sort of emotional state is at the time. But distractions will happen. In fact, being distracted is a normal type of, of experience in meditation. And when you know that you're being distracted, you are actually being mindful. So you're not being bad at meditation when you meditate. If you know you're distracted, that means that you are no longer distracted. So the, the, the reason why I'm saying this is that when distractions happen, and they always happen, many beginners become very frustrated. And they say like, what is this? Why can't I focus on my breath for just measly 15 minutes? In reality, unless you're a monk somewhere meditating all day, you will be distracted. Now, uh, I understand that you might get upset with yourself because you were distracted, but just be mindful, I guess, of the fact how absurd it is to become upset with yourself when you're no longer distracted. If you're aware of the distraction, you're not distracted. So when you're distracted, you don't know that you're distracted. So once you realize that you're distracted, you gently refocus back on the object. 
and then we start the cycle over again. And it's this relentless, patient and kind coming back to the object of meditation that actually is the core of the practice. Now, I will say that again, that is the core of the practice. So you're, you're meant to be distracted and you're meant to come back to the breath. What you will notice in the beginning is that the, these periods of distraction can be quite long. I remember when I was starting out with mindfulness, which was a decade ago, maybe longer, actually. I used to spend a lot of time on the meditation cushion thinking about what I'm supposed to do tomorrow. I was still in medical school when I was when I was starting to learn mindfulness. And I remember I would just get into these things of like thinking about genetics or biochemistry or whatever it is that I was studying at the time. And then I would just at some point hear the, <laughs> the alarm and I would realize that half of my meditation session was really just me being distracted. And then as I was practicing more and more, I was getting the impression in the beginning that I actually really suck at this meditation thing because it seemed to me that I'm getting distracted all the time. It's like every few seconds, I'm like, oh, let go of internal medicine, come back to the breath. Let go of pathology, come back to the breath. Let go of how uncomfortable this cushion is, go back to the breath. And what was really happening is that as my, as my attention was becoming stabilized, I was becoming more and more aware of these distractions. So instead of having one 20 minute long distraction, I was having 21 minute long distractions. So as your attention is stabilizing, you may actually think that you're being worse, quote unquote, in meditation. And then slowly these episodes of distraction will become rarer and shorter in duration and your attention will stabilize. So it's very important, especially when you start to be patient with yourself. Patience is something that meditation teaches you, but it's also something that reinforces your meditation practice. This right here, I would say, is enough theory for you to start meditating right now. So you can just select anything as your object of meditation and just start doing it. This is about as much theory as you need to know. I'm of course being slightly reductionist here and there are many other things that it's very nice if you know, but in terms of how little you need to actually start meditating, well, this is all you need. Just focus on your breath and start. I will give you four more uh, concepts that will help you understand the experience of meditation. Uh, I call these the four pillars of mindfulness, but now that I'm reading it, it sounds very pretentious because it's not my idea to be a grand theorist of mindfulness or to do anything, you know, like comprehensive and gigantic. It's just a convenient way that I can sort of explain some ideas and psychological, I suppose, concepts and, and skills that you cultivate in mindfulness. So there are, those are the four A's. Attention, awareness, acceptance, and agency. These are four concepts that you work with every time you sit down to meditate. They're very useful to understand because then you will get, I guess, more clarity and direction in which you, and you will easily find the direction you need to go into. But at the same time, uh, they will teach you about what you will cultivate even more. So it's like, um, it's like a cycle that reinforces itself all the time. They're cultivated by meditation, but at the same time, they help you cultivate your practice. So first is attention. So that, that's something that comes from the very definition of mindfulness. If you remember, it's a particular way of paying attention. So attention is really just selecting one object or a group of object out of our entire field of awareness. Uh, if you look at this picture here, not the camera, the, the lower picture with the German word in it, that's what you're focusing on. So the entire, the entire circle is everything you're aware of. So it's the totality of your thoughts, emotions, sensations, feelings, everything, sensory impressions, all of it. But the word noch here in the center that's clear, that's what you're focused on. That's the breath, that's a specific region of your body or a phrase or anything else. So that's attention. I hope that's clear because I think it's the, the visual version of it is much clearer than anything I can explain. So what's sharp, that's what 
your that's what your attention is anchored in. And attention as a as a function of your psyche is basically the ability to take one object out of your entire field of awareness and look at that object. So you need attention to be able to meditate, but at the same time, as you meditate, you strengthen your concentration or the ability to direct your attention where you want it to be. So that's one aspect of it. This is why, for example, uh, mindfulness also has its place in treatment of ADD, for example. Um, because it's essentially a, an attention training program. Second A is awareness. Uh, so awareness is really our ability to perceive. So it's ability to be conscious of something. When we talk about awareness here, we mean everything that you're aware of. And as you practice mindfulness, as the time goes by, your field of awareness will kind of expand. Very frequently, when I talk to people about skin picking, one thing that I will always, always, always ask and is what is it that you think about and what is it that you feel just before you start picking? And very often I will either get an I don't know as an answer or one of those vague non-answers, which is I feel uncomfortable, which technically speaking means absolutely nothing. It's you know, if you ask me what's your name and I say my name is not Michael, that's about a concrete answer as uncomfortable as it is, or stressed, which is also another way to say something is happening, I think it's unpleasant, but I have really no idea what it is. Or they will say I'm bored, which also doesn't really mean anything in psychological terms. It just means something is happening below the surface, but I really don't know how to put it into words. And I don't think our entire psychology can always be put into words, but much more than I'm uncomfortable can be put into words. The reason why I usually don't like these ways of phrasing and kind of making sense of, of, of our experience is because it doesn't give you tools to work with it. If you say, I feel uncomfortable, then what exactly is the direction to go in to make you feel what, comfortable? It doesn't really, I mean, does it give you a practical tool? Not really. I suppose if you're sitting in, in an, on an uncomfortable chair, you can wiggle around, but that's about it. In psychological terms, uncomfortable doesn't mean much. So having more awareness of your own psychological processes is really just extremely, extremely important for change. In fact, I would say that you can't really properly change without having sufficient awareness. And with mindfulness, we're kind of learning to fine tune our awareness. We expand the field of awareness, so we become aware of more and more things, but we also become aware of all the details and nuances. So th this is why I selected this painting. So as you know, those of you that attend other webinars, I just put all kinds of paintings that I in some way relate to the, to the topic. So this is actually a very large scale painting of a slice of lemon. And look at it carefully. Like this is not a normal slice of lemon. I mean, it is lemon, we can all recognize it. We can all say it's painted very realistically, and it is, but we're very rarely mindful of lemons in, in this many details. No one cuts a slice of lemon, and then looks at all the shades of colors and all the differences and all these tiny little details. But with mindfulness, that is what we're learning to do. Look at lemons. I'm just kidding, of course not. But we are learning to look at the details and this kind of fine, fine, fine details of our experiences. So you will, when, when I say, when you say I feel uncomfortable and I say, what thoughts come when you feel uncomfortable? Once your field of awareness is expanded and developed, you will be able to say, okay, so these were my thoughts. Or you will be able to say, um, well, I felt this and this. Sometimes it will be hard to identify an emotion, but that won't be as important because you will be able to describe everything that happens in your body. So you will say, I don't know how to call this emotion, but I felt squeezing in my chest or I felt my throat tighten or I felt heaviness in my legs or tension in my shoulders or you know, whatever else. So awareness is psychologically very important and it's something that grows out of, out of, the, out of regular mindfulness practice. It teaches us to look at our aware, our, our psyche in more details, and also to be able to kind of sustain more details at once. 
So you will, your experience will become fuller. It's not like you will just be able to more, see thoughts more clearly. You will be able to at the same time experience the thoughts and the emotions and the sounds and everything else that you may feel. I hope this is clearer to you by now. Then agency. So the reason why we can select an object of meditation is because we have agency. The reason why we can return our attention to the object of meditation is because we have agency. The reason why we sit to meditate is because we have agency. So in, agency is a very practical thing to me. Uh, so it's our ability to choose. It's not necessarily that we're responsible for every thought that we have, because as I said, we cannot really control all the thoughts that our brains make. But agency means that we can carefully look at what's happening in our experience and choose what to respond to and choose how to respond to it. One, when we're not mindful enough, we usually behave in a sense um, like we're obligated to follow through on, on, on our urges. And this is not just about skin picking. This really goes for everything. Like when you're extremely hungry, for example, or extremely thirsty, you feel compelled to drink water or to eat. And the same way when you feel the urge to pick, very frequently you feel compelled to follow through on that urge. And that is not agency, right? That's just being very reactive to the urge. When we cultivate our agency, we cultivate our ability to choose how to act. It's what we call in the mindfulness words, mindfulness lingo, in other words, we call it, uh, we call it being proactive rather than being reactive. And as you expand your field of awareness, you, be, you become, you, you gain, I guess, more agency is a better way to say it. So in everyday life, that means that you make more conscious choices about your behavior and about your thoughts and about your feelings. And then that means that you can take a more active role in how your life will develop, um, how your relationships will develop, how you will direct your career, how you will set boundaries with other people. It doesn't mean that these choices become any easier. It just means that you're able to recognize those moments when you're making them and you're able to act in accordance with your values or your needs in the moment, instead of just simply reflexively responding in a way that you were taught to or bullied into or pushed into and so on. This is a very important facet of mindfulness because the very possibility of change rests on agency. If we can't choose, then we can change. Change is something we have to choose and it's not one choice, obviously, it's a, it's a beginning of a whole series of choices. So by cultivating agency, we're actually making it easier for ourselves to change. And it makes us more responsible for our lives, for better or worse, because that is a terrifying prospect. And then we have acceptance. Now, as part of the program uh, at SkinPick, we always discuss acceptance. Uh, after all, skin pick is based on acceptance and commitment therapy, which kind of implies that we talk about acceptance, right? And acceptance is always a concept that, that kind of riles people up. And not very frequently, but often enough, people will react to the idea of acceptance almost aggressively, or at least in a very emotional way. Um, they will say, what do you mean I need to accept picking? I will never accept picking. From, I understand where they're coming from, of course, but from, from my point of view as a therapist, unless you accept something, you can't really change it. But very frequently people interpret the concept of acceptance as just agreeing with what's happening. Whereas when I talk about acceptance and when we talk about acceptance in psychology in general, what we're talking about is acknowledging what's happening, to be with what's happening, to observe what's happening. As we meditate, we don't try to change our experience. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we have to agree with the experience. So for example, you will have unpleasant thoughts. But what does it mean not to accept that you're having these thoughts when it's the rea reality of your experience you're having them? 
So in a sense, not to accept is to deny the reality of your own experience. And if you deny the reality of your own experience, you can't really change your experience. At the same time, acceptance is something that is very compassionate and kind. It's not wasting energy to convince yourself that something is not the way it is. I guess the, the simplest way to, to summarize acceptance is things are as they are. And you see them as they appear to you in that moment. And that's all that is. But like mindfulness, it's simple, but it's not really easy to implement. But it's crucial. If, if you want to really deal with skin picking, there's no way around acceptance. Uh, I like to compare this, and I often I often compare this to uh, how can a surgeon, for example, operate on someone if they're not able to look at blood or internal organs or just gross stuff in general. If you can't look at what you're doing, then you're not doing surgery, you're butchering someone. And the same thing goes for, for psychological change. You have to look at the problem, see where it extends, what is it what is connected to how is it manifesting in your life because otherwise if you're not able to do that how can you create a path forward to change that's why acceptance is crucial not just when it comes to practicing mindfulness but also when it comes to psychotherapy and especially when it comes to dealing with pain Uh, so I will just read through this poem and try not to ruin it, but this is also, um, this is a nice way, I think, to explain what mindfulness is using words that I don't think I would ever come up with myself. So it's a poem called The Guest House by Rumi. And he says, this being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house, empty of its furniture, steal, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Now, whether or not each has been sent as a guide from beyond, I really don't know. And when I do find out, I doubt that I will be able to tell you. But I think that this poem contains a lot of wisdom. First, it's a beautiful explanation of what mindfulness is. You look at yourself as a guest house for all these mental experiences that come and go. Sometimes when we suffer, in that moment as we suffer, as we suffer mindlessly, we think that suffering will last forever. But in fact, what we learn through the experience of mindfulness, I'm not talking about one sitting, I'm talking about continuous practice now, is that every experience arises, lasts for a while, and then passes away. So there's nothing permanent about our experience. And really, today is a joy, tomorrow will be depression, and the day after, you will have a visitor that is going to destroy your house, but the visitor will leave and you will rebuild your house and you will make a better house. And in fact, because you've had these difficult visitors, you will grow as a human being. There is one exercise in session six in Skin Picks program that talks about gratitude or expressing gratitude for difficult thoughts. And it's one of those exercises that people either love or absolutely hate and are offended by the very idea that they should be grateful for something that tortures them psychologically. I think this poem and mindfulness allow you to find a way to look at it from a different perspective. So when I look at my life back, so I, I don't mean to turn this into a confessional, but there are many events that when I was sort of caught in the midst of them or when I caused them or when they were done to me or whatever, you know, we all have all of those in our lives. 
you think how it's all pointless and meaningless and why me and all these things. But in reality, now when I look back, I can see that without some traumas in the past that I had to work through and had to work very hard to work through, I wouldn't be a resilient person now. Without many adverse things that have happened, I wouldn't build patience, for example. I wouldn't be able to stay, I don't know, calm, for example, while we're in the middle of a pandemic if I didn't experience events previously that have given me tools to deal with these things. So whatever bad experiences we have, if we open up to them and allow them to transform us, then we learn from them. And then all of the pain that we went through is not useless. So that was the, the guest house. But I like this idea that whatever, um, uh, that we should sort of greet every experience laughing and invite them in. Because that's exactly what acceptance is and that's exactly what being with experience is. It's just, if sadness comes while we meditate, we say, okay, now we're sad, let's observe sadness. And then you look at what sadness does to your body and what sadness does to your mind, and you learn. I would like to give you some resources before we proceed. Uh, there, there, there's a really just too many books on mindfulness out there. Like if you go to any website that sells books, you type mindfulness, you'll get pages and pages of results. Uh, because I teach mindfulness, I like to read things that are published and just sort of to keep up with how people teach mindfulness. And every now and then you come up with a very interesting example or a nice metaphor or, you know, something that will make me a better teacher, hopefully one day. But if I put myself in the shoes of people who start to practice, who are starting to practice mindfulness, I think, my God, how do they even go through this? pile of books and how do they even select the ones that are good because most of them I assure you are really not that good. So I chose three books that are absolute classics when it comes to mindfulness. Uh, you cannot go wrong with either of these. Uh, wherever you go, there you are is maybe the first book I ever read on mindfulness and a book that I still love very much. Um, it contains a lot of information. It introduces you to all the basic techniques, but it's not a formal structured book. So the book has a very nice conversational reflective tone to it. It includes a little bit of poetry, examples. John Kabat-Zinn has a really beautiful way of writing. And I, I really, really appreciate this. So if you don't need too much structure, this book is a really good way to go. Real Happiness by Sharon Salzberg is a month long program that will help you establish your practice step by step. So if you do want structure, this is the way to go. And then there is Full Catastrophe Living, which is a book for people who like both structure and theory. This is a huge book. So Full Catastrophe Living is, I think, the, the edition that I have, which is not this one. It's quite a big book, and it has like 600 pages or something. And that's not even the biggest book in the job that's in written ever. So Full Catastrophe Living is a book that contains a lot of theory. He explains in great detail every step of his mindfulness-based stress reduction program, uh, gives you examples, gives you instructions for practices. It can be a little bit overwhelming. So if you're not a person that likes theorizing, you may want to go with real happiness or wherever you go there you go. But all three books are excellent in their own right. My recommendation would be that if you want to start with books, you choose one of these three, and then when you master the techniques that are in there, you can really go and read anything else. They all have different, like I said, one is for people who just like informal style, one is for people who like structured style, and the third is for people who like theory. So I suppose most of you can find something there that's useful. Now, there are also many apps out there. I put three here also for different reasons. Inside Timer is maybe the most popular meditation app out there, aside from maybe, I don't know, Headspace, but it's certainly the biggest community of people who meditate. So Inside Timer, a lot is it's basically a social network for people who meditate. So you can find teachers, follow teachers, you can um, add friends, you can send messages, you have discussion groups where you can ask questions, read other people's experiences. You have thousands and thousands of guided meditations on nearly any topic. 
some quite advanced, many of them for beginners. There are really good meditations out there. Unfortunately, there's also a lot of stuff because almost anyone can publish your insight timer. They do quality control in ways that I don't quite understand how, but the, the problem, I guess, with Inside Timer is that sometimes you will run across meditations that are heavily spiritual in a way that might not be in, compatible with whatever your spirituality is, because they have, they have um, there's, there's a little bit of everything. So when you select the meditation, even though there is a description, it's always a little bit of, you know, guessing game, what is it that you will end up with? But you can find really good quality material on Inside Timer. Another thing that I also don't necessarily like about Inside Timer is that they um, they offer like when you when you select a meditation practice, they will tell you how long it is. They will give you a description who the teacher is, and then what the teacher assesses is the level of difficulty. Most people tend to ignore this, and not every teacher has the same criteria. I think it's very important to start with practices that are really adequate for beginners. If you start from 125 minute guided loving kindness meditation, you're really not likely to have a second meditation session ever again, because two hours of visualizing people you don't like and people that you have difficult relationships with and offering them loving kindness is too much, even for people who are quite experienced at meditation. So that's one downside to Inside Timer is that the levels of difficulty that are indicated there don't necessarily correlate with my experience as a teacher, which doesn't mean that my experience is the end all and be all, it's just an observation that I make. And also, uh, I think when people ignore those labels, like what's for beginners, what's for advanced meditators, they kind of get into things that maybe you shouldn't be. So I remember one friend of mine who, I recommended Inside Timer, and I also recommended specific meditations for him, and I sent him links. And then, of course, he didn't listen to my advice. He found something that sounded really cool, which was a meditation where you visualize your own death, and then he ended up with a panic attack. So you really need to be careful with Inside Timer how you choose meditations, because specifically, for example, the one the practices that he chose are practices that I quite enjoy, but I've been meditating for 10 years, and maybe that's why I enjoy them. In the beginning, I'm not sure I would really ever want to visualize my own death. So that's Inside Timer. You have this meditation and relaxation app by Fitness22. It's not an entirely free app, but it is my absolute favorite to recommend to beginners. Uh, the reason why is because it has a very it has a good selection of practices. So with this app, you will get a taste of every every main major flavor of mindfulness, so to speak. You will have awareness practices, concentration practices, body focus practices, visualization practices, whatever you can think of, you have it there. And you have it in three different lengths. So if you, for example, start focusing on your breath, you have, I think, uh, seven, 14, and 21 minutes. So you can start with the short one and then over time progress to the long ones. And the longest ones are 20 minutes, so that's not too much. It's entirely adapted to beginners. Meditations are guided rather nicely as well. And you have Meditation Studio that it's similar to, to this, to the one by Fitness 22, just in my opinion, not as good. It offers more meditations by different teachers, but I prefer the middle one. So you have all three in every Play Store, App Store, whatever you use, so you can try them out if you like, if you like guided meditations. I recommend that you start off with guided meditations, but then after a few months, it's really, I think, good to try doing it without guidance. So you just set the timer and then do the technique yourself. Uh, with this email, like I said, with this webinar, you will receive a list of resources. So I will send you two guided meditations. I will send you the books that I recommended. And I will also send you some websites where you can download guided meditations. If you don't like to use any apps. I'm going to give you a little bit about why mindfulness works now. I won't go into terribly too many details because there's really a lot and I tend to get carried away when it comes to neuroscience. So I will try to be brief and concise. And then afterwards, I will tell you briefly what is it that you can expect to experience as a benefit for skin picking. 
And also, what is it that you cannot expect to experience? Because mindfulness is, is very useful, but it's not a panacea. Uh, let me just move myself some, oops, sorry. Um, one second. Okay, I was trying to move myself down here so that this brain can be seen better. Uh, so let's start with the, with the main thing. So the first, the first kind of studies of mindfulness were done thanks to John Kabat-Zinn and his NVSR program. And today you have like, well, I think it's safe to say thousands of decent papers in mindfulness. Research in mindfulness has one flaw, which is that not many studies have been replicated. And in the beginning, at least now it's changing in the, in the, in the past years, is that the studies weren't really methodologically very sound. However, the results now are slowly being replicated and they're being confirmed largely, which I think is really, really important so that we can see there's solid science behind it. So let's start with, the, with, the, with this person here or rather with this brain here. Uh, one of the first findings that we had when well, we, oh, that's the way we, that we sound good, that we had when, when, when we started researching mindfulness is how it affects the activation and the structure of the prefrontal cortex. That's the part of the brain um, right here under your eyes. If you can see on the picture where I'm, where I'm pointing to. So what happens with people who are newbies as practitioners so people who complete, let's say, the eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction program is that you have differences in activation of the prefrontal cortex as opposed to people who don't meditate. And when, when they studied meditators who have been doing this for years, uh, like Buddhist monks or just lay practitioners that are very consistent, what, what they actually found were structural differences. So your prefrontal cortex, the gray matters, the gray matter anyway, was thicker the longer you meditated and much thicker statistically than people who don't meditate. So what does this mean, this prefrontal cortex thing? That's where the stable attention comes from. That's where what I call proactive behavior or agency mostly comes from. Meaning that our ability to look at our emotions or thoughts and think about them differently and then act differently comes from this. But at the same time, our ability to focus and be still also comes from this. So prefrontal cortex is connected to many, many different regions. But one region specifically that's very important and that it's connected to is the limbic system. I guess most of you know the limbic system is, what process, is what's in charge of processing our emotions. So that kind of tells you that, that mindfulness has also something to do with, with changing our emotional responses. But then. Other studies have also shown that mindfulness really affects the limbic system itself. So not just how we respond to emotions, but also how we process emotions. The, the part here that's highlighted, this is a picture that I took from Wikipedia. So uh, this is anterior cingulate cortex. It's also part of the limbic system. And this is one part of the cortex, one part of the limbic system that changes both its activity and its structure with mindfulness practitioners, but it's not the only one. There's another one which is more famous, and more important, but it's not labeled here. It will be somewhere around here where my cursor is showing. It's the amygdala. So uh, the amygdala is connected, of course, to the rest of the limbic system, and it's shown to be different in size with people who meditate for a very long time, and its activity is also different with people who meditate. So this means that your actual processing of emotion alters when you meditate for a very long time. It's not just how you respond, but it's also what you feel that changes. And then another set of results that are very important for skin picking in particular is this part of the cortex that's kind of hidden beneath the surface. So normally when you look at the brain, like here, you don't see it. So you have to move kind of the temporal and the prior cortex aside to uncover this little bit of cortex. It's called insula. It means island in Latin. And why it's called island is because it's this little island of cortex beneath the cortex. 
So studies have shown that when people meditate for a very long time, the front part of this, so this front part of the right insole specifically, so it's this one that we're looking at. Uh, I see, I'm sorry, uh, uh, but I see that a lot of you are raising your hands and using the, the chat as well. I would just ask you kindly to ask your questions in the, the Q&A part because that way it will be much easier for me to see all your questions because sometimes in the chat they, they tend to get lost. So the, 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 what, the, what studies have shown is that insular cortex becomes thicker. So the front part, I'm pointing my finger at the screen. So the, the front part here on the right becomes thicker. So why is this important, you may ask? And I'll tell you. So it's important because this part of the cortex is responsible for our awareness. But not awareness in the sense of just being awake, but specifically in processing the sensory input. It tells us what's happening in our bodies, and it processes the, the, the impulses that we get from the outside environment. So what happens when you practice mindfulness and what's hardwired into your brain is that your awareness becomes much sharper. So if you're supposed to tune into your body and sort of check how you feel, you can do that with much more precision if you're a meditator for a very long time. If you remember in the beginning, I was saying how people frequently have trouble mentalizing their emotions and putting them into words and even describing them. Well, this little part of the brain is what will help you be more efficient with that. And in general, the idea that a mental practice can rewire your brain and actually alter the structure of your brain is, I think, incredibly liberating. Very often, very often people talk about certain uh, characteristics that they have as people or certain behaviors and say, well, that's just the kind of person I am. That's just my character or, you know, that's genetic because that's like a go-to layman's explanation for everything. And that kind of eliminates the possibility of change. Or people will say, well, this is hardwired in me. And you have all this body of research and mindfulness that says that even though some things may actually be written into your brain structure because they have been present for so long. That's not your fate by any means. Diligent practice, repetition, consistency will change even your brain structure. So saying that something is hardwired is no longer a scientifically sound excuse not to change. So resistance to change will have to find a better way to articulate itself. Again, this takes consistency, it takes practice, but it is doable. So I find that one of, like I, in general, if you attend these webinars, you know that I like neuroscience and I like these kinds of studies. But to me, all these studies that deal with neuroplasticity and mindfulness, that tell us that basically if we cultivate a certain approach to thinking, a certain set of values, and if we apply these consistently, we can actually alter the physical structure of our brain. I find that to be just fascinating. So I'm not only telling you this because I find it fascinating, but because I also find it useful. That is the extent and I guess the power of mindfulness. It's, it's a, when I say that it's a prof profoundly transformational practice, I don't mean just psychologically. So how is it that mindfulness can help with skin picking? One, Increased awareness means that there will be less mindless picking. So less automatic picking means more focused picking. If you're more aware of your picking, that means that you can apply competing responses or any other technique that you learn throughout the program or on your own. Being more proactive versus being reactive means that you're able to actually consciously choose your response to the urge that you feel. Now, for me as a therapist, this is incredible. But what's even more important is that you learn how to think differently about the urge. Uh, I, if, I think it was last month, wasn't it, that we talked about emotional regulation. And I was talking about how it's important for us to understand our emotions. And the same goes with urges. When you can think about it from a different perspective, 
you can find different ways to conceptualize the urge. So something that was a message you must pick now can become a message, uh, this relationship is not good for you. You need to set proper boundaries. Or it can mean this situation is making you anxious. You need to find tools to change your situation. Or um, your work-life balance is completely off, so you need to make some difficult decisions and restore proper balance. When we're being, when we're being proactive, we're able to think differently. And as a therapist, I, that's about as big a gift as anyone can give me. You become more, re more resilient to stress. Your baseline anxiety levels are lower when you practice mindfulness in the long run. So everything I'm saying is sort of for long-term meditators, which you can become if you start doing mindfulness tomorrow. Uh, what, what this means is that essentially events that you cannot predict or events that are not very nice or that are just downright incredibly difficult will have a lesser effect on you. They will still have an effect. And because your insula will be so sharp and developed, you will feel these effects maybe in a way that you can't even feel them now, but the stability, the equanimity, the, the proactive attitude that mindfulness gives you means that you will be able to use these experiences to grow and to change and to learn lessons instead of just being reactive and then further stressed out by thinking as a reaction to this. Improved emotional regulation, I guess we need to get into details about why that's good. And also it increases compassion. Uh, if you remember in the beginning when I was talking about going back to the object of meditation after you're distracted, I emphasized kindly, kindly, kindly several times. This is because I really meant it. When you, when you go back to the object, to breath or body or whatever you're meditating on, and you do that by kind of nudging yourself to go back, instead of saying, oh my God, will you just focus? You're really cultivating a different experience, different relationship to yourself. And those are very small steps. So it's very difficult to develop huge resistance to them. But these steps over time will seep into your life. For example, I, I noticed one huge change over the years as, um, as I was practicing mindfulness, and it relates to compassion. And I'm, as I'm now saying this, I'm starting to kind of discuss it with myself, so should I share it or not? Because I don't know exactly what it says about me. But in medical school, they kind of teach you to be compassionate on a very, very intellectual level. Like they will give you all these ideas about what your job is and how important your job is because you're supposed to reduce suffering and save lives and all these things, which somehow in medical discourse translate into being slightly arrogant because you're doing a very important job. But the actual experience of compassion is not something that many physicians have in my experience. And this is, I think, because we don't really know how to handle it. No one teaches you how to handle your own emotions when you're in medical school. So what you usually learn to do is to just push them in some, you know, some corner of your psyche and try not to pay attention to them. And what I learned practicing mindfulness over the years is that I've become much more emotional. Other people's suffering affects me more intensely than it did when I was in medical school. And surprisingly, I don't think of this as bad. Now, if I talk to a version of myself from, I don't know, 2005 or something, and I would tell myself, my God, stop being so touchy-feely. Like, this is not going to get you anywhere. But actually, I think it's getting me, you know, it's getting me quite a lot. It allows me to feel what my clients are feeling. But because meditation gives me the pro ability to choose my reaction and the strength to withhold difficult emotions, they don't distress me. But they add so much more to my experience. They kind of make me, I don't know, I feel more alive sometimes. I'm being touched by more things, in, metaphorically speaking, and I'm being, I, I'm kind of affected by emotions of other people more than I was before. Um, I'll show emotions more than I would before, but all this comes with a, with a level of stability that before, when I was stuck and didn't show emotion, that I really didn't have. And now when I look back at myself, what I thought was strength, which is like seeing people who are in terrible condition and who suffer a lot and not flinching, I thought that was being very strong. I see as just being unable to deal with the intensity of not just 
my own emotion, but, but also theirs. And mindfulness really teaches you how to feel all these things and just stay calm and just feel them and look at what you're feeling and learn from that, but not being overwhelmed by it. I think when it comes to picking, this is an invaluable skill to have. And the reason why I say this is because a large part of picking, as, as we know from acceptance and commitment therapy and the way we conceptualize uh, problems in, in ACT, is what we call experiential avoidance. Very, very, very often people will pick to channel their stress or to channel their, their anxiety because somehow it's much easier and, 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 and simpler to process a physical thing rather than an emotion. And it, so this shifts. And when you're able to process stress or anxiety or sadness or anger or whatever the cause may be, then picking loses its function. It's not necessary anymore. You don't need the relief picking gives you because now you have a more compassionate approach to yourself and you have more knowledge of what your emotions mean and, and how they work. And then you can get that release differently. And oftentimes you really don't even need it anymore because you're affected by fewer things in that way. So both formal and informal mindfulness practice will help. Although I have to say formal practice takes precedence. I didn't introduce these terms sooner, so I will clarify them now. Formal practice is when you sit and do mindfulness for 20 minutes once a day or twice a day if you're really dedicated. My own practice is somewhat longer and more complicated, so I don't, wouldn't use myself as a, as a reference. But when I was starting, I started with 20 minutes a day. And then I, then I went to 20 minutes twice a day, and then I slowly sort of increased afterwards. Uh, so that's formal practice. It's when you sit and do a specific technique in a specific way for a specified period of time, a lot of specified minutes. Informal practice is when you bring mindfulness into an activity. Uh, very frequently, people will, will say things like, I don't need to meditate because X is my meditation like jogging is my meditation, or um, I don't know, cleaning or ironing is my meditation. These things are not your meditation. So mind, jogging is not mindfulness because jogging is jogging and mindfulness is mindfulness. What you can do is approach these things in a mindful way. So for example, the, what, I, what I usually do is because I really hate doing it otherwise, is washing dishes. So that's my preferred informal mindfulness activity. I will focus on my hands and what they do as I wash dishes. I will pay attention to how the water feels, how the detergent feels, how it feels to touch the plates, how it feels to touch the food, which usually feels gross. But that, for me, that's a very good way to learn how to be with what I like, which is the water and the detergent, like the kind of slippery feeling, but also how to approach something that grosses me out, which is remainders of food just slapped all over the play. So that would be an example of an informal practice. You can do your chores using informal mindfulness. You can jog. You can do yoga, for example. That would also be a form of informal mindfulness practice. These two things complement each other. If you only have to choose one, choose formal practice. Ideally, you will do both. Um, so it's a part of the solution in the sense that it gives you a degree of control. It gives you a degree of awareness, but it's not going to give you willingness. The fact that you're proactive doesn't mean that you will use your proactivity. So the fact that you have agency doesn't mean that you will choose to use agency. Sometimes we relinquish our agency and say, well, mm, I actually can't really do much about it, right? So the component of willingness and motivation to change, resistance to change, it's not going to fall off fall away and disappear just because you're being mindful. So it's very important to pay attention to resistance to change. And to all these things, all these excuses that you make not to meditate, excuses that you make not to use competing responses and so on and so on. I guess excuse is a bit of a hard word, but my point is, is that mindfulness will give you the tools, but it will not necessarily give you the willingness to apply them. And it will not necessarily resolve every reservation or resistance you have to change. And rest assured, no matter how much you want to get rid of picking, you always have a degree of resistance to change. 
that's just a normal part of human experience. We don't like change. We change only when we really have no choice and we absolutely have to. And part of why we resist change is because we didn't really figure out all the benefits that we get from the behavior that we want to change. So that also can invite you to meditate on why is it that you don't want to change. So you can kind of use mindfulness to dissect your resistance as well. But mindfulness in and of itself is not going to re resolve resistance. It's more effective when it's combined with something. So I put competing responses here, but it can be stimulus control, it can be cognitive diffusion, it can be referring to your values, it can be goal setting, it can be any of the techniques that you learn in the skin pick program. But the reason why I say it's more effective is because when you become aware of the urge, let's say, and even if you're able to proactively sort of kind of observe the urge and not react to it, it's still better if you apply a competing response. Because remember, in the long run, the idea is to change the habit. So introduce a healthy habit every time you can. Next, uh, next month, we will talk about habit formation and how to establish and, and maintain habits. So we'll deal more with this part. But what I'm saying here is that if you can combine mindfulness with something else, that is much better. So you'll get a better effect. There are specific practices that can help you. So every type of mindfulness that you practice is good and it's better than not to practice it. However, there are some practices that might work better for you. This, this last line on the slide here that I'm talking about now, I don't have any empirical evidence to tell you this. So I'm drawing on my experience as a therapist. I'm drawing on my own experience practicing mindfulness and also on studies of mindfulness that we have. But to my knowledge, no one has done a comparative study of different styles of mindfulness and then said this is better for skin picking or this is worse. Compassion helps. And the reason why compassion helps is because I very often see that people who, uh, who pick their skin are very hard on themselves. So when you fail sometimes, and you will fail because you're human, it doesn't help for you to become very hard on yourself and to yell at yourself and to additionally abuse yourself for failing. Why doesn't it help? It doesn't help because picking hurts. Picking harms your skin and causes also psychological pain. So it's a very difficult experience overall. When you come in with hateful self-talk, it just adds more stress and more pain onto something that is really very painful. It's like basically having an open wound and then just poking it with your finger. When you develop a compassionate relationship with yourself, you then aim by default to, to ease your suffering. So in these situations, when you already suffer, you don't tell yourself, oh my God, you're so stupid, or, or how can you possibly fail again, or you'll never get better. You don't do that because you don't want to pile on more suffering. Instead, you find ways to help your skin heal and you find ways to help yourself move on. And then with a clear head, you come back, examine the experience, learn the lesson and do better. So compassion is good because it reduces your overall suffering. And also what it does is help you, helps, helps you learn your lessons and do better with the kind of cooler head. Forgiveness is also very good as a mindful, as a meditation practice for the very same reason. And then body scans are also very good because they're the ones that are more, most likely going to increase your body, your body awareness. So you will be more aware of the urges, you will be more aware of the stress or anxiety that accumulate. So that will give you a chance to sort of intervene before they become too strong. And at the end of the day, it's going to give you more awareness of what your body is doing. So you will notice that you're picking or that you're about to pick. Now, not all these practices will be equally easy for everyone, equally accessible for everyone. So it's best to try them all, or at least the ones that look interesting to you or not as threatening or not as difficult, and then start with these. I can give you rough suggestions, but your experience is still the ultimate judge. So if you have a very big issue with control, for example, it's best if you start with compassion, forgiveness, or body scans instead of focusing on your breath. Because one of the things when you focus on your breath is you're not supposed to control it. You're just supposed to observe it. And since breath is such a vital function for all of us, 
it is very difficult for a person that has issues with control to just calmly observe the breath, especially when you notice that you're breathing tightly or that you don't inhale enough air or that there are these long pauses between breaths. I remember I don't have a particular issue with control and still I was stunned once or twice, is that I would observe my breath and as you ease into a meditation and especially if you do it for a very long time, I was on a retreat, so it was like an hour-long session or something like this, or I was maybe practicing in my room additionally. I like long sessions. You, you need a lot of time to work up to them, but they really kind of take your practice to the next level. And I remember I was really very relaxed and my mind was very still, and it was a very, very pleasant session. One of those when you think, like, if my mind can be this, can be this clear for the rest of my life, so it's like that would already be. And so I was focusing on my breath and I was noticing how slow it is. And like, you could know, like it's just a moment of very nice, clear, sharp awareness. And then I noticed that I exhaled at one point and I didn't inhale again. And so I was waiting and I was like, okay, one second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. And I thought, <laughs> why am I not breathing? And what the hell is happening here? And it was very interesting because, um, your body, of course, knows how, how to breathe because breathing is one of the most regulated functions that we have, precisely because it is so vital. In fact, breathing is so incredibly precise that the pH of your blood, which is maintained by breathing, among other things, varies very, very, very little. Like, very bad things can happen to you. You can ingest all kinds of things. You can have problems with your kidneys. You can even have problems with your breath, but it's so well regulated that it always sort of remains within a very small margin of error. So if my breathing was so slow, that means that I just didn't need to breathe differently in that moment. But because the pause was so long, I was thinking like, what am I supposed to do now? Like, like is this what dying looks like? And then I started panicking and then, and then I started breathing again slightly faster and I was like, oh no, okay, I'm fine. So if you have issues with control, experiences like this can be really very destabilizing. So it might be easier to start with body scans or visualization practices like mountain meditation or lake meditation, something that will ground you, give you some sort of firmness, and also that will give you, because med visualizations kind of ask of you to use your agency a little more and do certain things with your mind. So that gives you a degree of control or at least a feeling of control. And then later on, you can move on to practices like working with your breath. Uh, so as we slowly finish, we will go to the q and I see that there's quite a number of questions and gosh, I see that I've, I'm like twice over time. So I yet again, apologize. I just wanted to say a few words about skin pick and then we'll go to the Q and A. Since they're, they're kind of allowing us to have these free webinars, I thought it would be nice to say a few words. First of all, you can download the free app and use it for self-monitoring, which is not exactly mindfulness, but it is a very quick way to learn how to associate your picking to certain thoughts and emotions and to identify your triggers and also to track your progress. So join the program or don't join the program, you can download the app and use it for free. If you have a therapist, you can use it with your therapist as well. Uh, it's an evidence-based program. It takes eight weeks to complete, providing that you're regular, of course, and you're assigned to a therapist, so you basically get professional guidance every step of the way. Uh, I do have to say that all the communication you have with your therapist is in writing, which is a, is a downside, but the upside is that you can communicate every day. And also you will discover that therapy in writing has its benefits. So even though the program is very structured, it's based on habit reversal and acceptance and commitment therapy. Because you're assigned to a therapist, you can customize the program and sort of make it your own. So check it out. Um, you can also schedule a consultation call with me if you have any questions about the program and how you will do that, you'll get an email notifying you. I'm not really quite sure. So uh, let's get started with your questions you can still keep asking them of course and i will get to each one 